Welcome to the InterAxis channel and InterAxis.io. Today we want to talk a little bit about Bitcoin to DeFi. That's what we're calling this, Bitcoin to DeFi. And the reason is because Bitcoin has obviously been, been really hot lately. We see lots more uh, investors, lots more hedge funds, lots more banks, everyone talking about investing in Bitcoin. Of course, there's been some volatility. But also DeFi has, has been incredibly impactful lately. We've seen um, technologists, we, we've seen technology investors, we've seen more funds investing in DeFi and, and the promise that decentralized finance can bring. Guys like you know, Mark Cuban talking about it quite a bit. NFTs have, have been uh, really popular lately. Huge funds in, in Asia and in Singapore investing in decentralized finance. And we want to explain a little bit about what it is and how we got here, how we got to DeFi from Bitcoin. So hopefully this will help explain a little bit. We're going to go really fast here. So first, we want to talk a little bit about Bitcoin and how it gave us decentralized finance and DeFi. Because remember, Bitcoin was kind of the original DeFi, the original idea. And our, if you remember, the problem that Bitcoin was trying to solve was this idea of fees and friction, the idea that government and banks really controlled so much. So I'm going to go back to my example I always have, Adam and Ron. Right, Ron uh, sells me some sort of goods, and I give Ron money, maybe in the form of a check. We'll, we'll talk about this in the old days, kind of in a check, but we know, tech, you know, from technology standpoint, it goes a little faster than that. But I give Ron a check. Now, Ron has to trust me, right? He has to, to trust that when I write my name on that check in that amount, that it's good. But Ron goes and puts the check in his bank. We'll call it Bank of America. Bank of America doesn't quite deposit the, the money in Ron's account. It goes and asks my bank, we'll call it Chase, does Adam have the money? My bank says, yes, they do. Bank of America says, okay, wire it to me. Right? So $100 comes out of my account, gets wired over to Bank of America. They say, okay, this is good. We're going to put this into Ron's account. That's how it works. This process might take a few days. Okay, which, which seems a little silly, but they make it, it takes a few days. Now remember, when I put money into this bank, it's not like they, ear, they, they put a, you know, a $100 bill in their vault and said, this is Adams. They just, they just made an accounting entry. It's just on a spreadsheet. It's just in a database that I had this money, and then they go do something else with it, right? So this whole process causes some bit of friction because it's not instantaneous. He doesn't instantly have the money. The banks have to reconcile all this. And because of that, they get to charge fees. Now, they have this because we've outsourced this function to them over years. And we've had to do that because we don't necessarily are able to trust each other. And we're also not able to walk around with wads of cash. It's not safe, it's not practical. So this is the system that developed. So it's not all that bad, it's just here's, here's where we got to because we had to outsource that trust. And for years, governments and banks uh, they, they, they were not kind to that trust. They didn't take care of that trust. Okay? They violated it by adding to the friction and adding to the fees because the friction and the fees is where they make money and where they have power. And so that was the idea of Bitcoin. And that's where Bitcoin came from is to say, can we, can we get away from that? Okay. So the idea of Bitcoin was, if you remember, can we figure out a way that Adam can send something of value, some sort of funding to Ron and not have to go through the banks. And maybe if that funding is not based on the government, because remember the U.S. government really controls the value of the U.S. dollar. Okay, They control the value of it by deciding how much they're going to release, how much they're going to create. So they kind of control the value. And so the, the framers of Bitcoin said, we don't, we don't like that. We don't like outsourcing that trust to the government, and we don't like outsourcing the, the transfer and the holding of money to banks. We want to be able to do it ourselves. Can we do it? And what they came up with was Bitcoin. So I can send Ron one Bitcoin, and you have all these miners or all these nodes connected to this decentralized network, right, all over the place, all connected to each other, that can process that transaction, this one Bitcoin that goes from Adam to Ron, and I can only send it if I had it to begin with. And once it's sent, all these miners agree in a decentralized way based on the Bitcoin code that, that, that they have to adhere to, that I, I had the Bitcoin and I sent it to Ron and now he has it. They all agreed on it. And what, was the, what did they get for that? The incentive structure for these miners to actually connect to this network and do this? The incentive structure was they got rewarded in Bitcoin. 
and they had to have faith early on that that Bitcoin was going to have some value. And they have been rewarded handsomely for that, you know, to 10, 12 years later. However, they had to have some faith that that would happen. Now, it, that has happened, that has come to fruition, but the most important thing we saw was that this decentralization, this idea that we could create this incentive structure to get people to connect and actually have a relationship like this and get people to connect and actually process these transaction means we don't necessarily have to outsource that to banks anymore. Okay, and the value of this Bitcoin is just based on market forces, right? And, and of course, we limited the supply, right? 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be created. And then the, the U.S. government can print all the dollars they want. It's just going to make the value of Bitcoin go up. So Bitcoin gave us this idea of this incentive structure. And it was successful. And from there, we've seen decentralized finance grow. Well, why is that? Because now what we found is, oh, well... well there are so many other things that banks do that we can take out those efficiencies and, and give them back to the people, give them back to those that want to help provide. Because now we don't have to outsource those, th that trust. We don't have to outsource those functions to banks anymore. We can outsource them to gr huge groups of decentralized individuals who connect via code and can process these transactions. And we can do it in a private way and in a trustless way and in a way that's also very transparent. So enter DeFi, and I'm going to go back to my Adam and Ron example. So we have Adam and we have Ron, and let's say Adam has $100,000 sitting in a, in a bank, and, and Ron needs to borrow for his business. Now, Ron might have a really good business plan going, so it's not like he's needy. It's not charity. He legitimately needs to borrow $100,000 for his business, and he's willing to pay 9% interest to borrow $100,000 because he thinks he can make 25% on his money. So he borrows it at 9, he makes 25, and, and he turns out pretty good. Now, if I know Ron, I can lend him the money because I know that he can make that business better and I know that I'm going to get paid my interest. Right Now, I might or might not take some sort of collateral for it. I might say, look, it's not worth it all, but, but if you can't pay me back, you're going to give me your car. We might know each other really well. We might know each other from the community, in which case I say, look, Ron, if you don't pay me back, I'm telling everyone that you owe me money, and you're not going to be welcome in this community anymore. So we might have, have that issue. But for the, the time being, I can lend him the money. He, he borrows it. He pays me back principal plus interest, right? That's what I get in return for giving him money. Now, I might not be able to get 9% anywhere else, so this is really good for me and my family because we're making 9% and we trust this. Now, the problem here is this relationship does not scale. It, we, we can't make it huge. I can't go find all the Rons that need money, and Ron can't necessarily go find all the people that have money that are willing to lend it to him based on, based on trust, right? He doesn't have all these people that trust him enough to lend him that much money. Enter, at some point, the banks, right? Because here's Adam and here's Ron, and now I have my $100,000. I put it here into this bank, and the bank says, we'll keep your money safe, Adam, don't worry. We'll even pay you some minuscule, you know, 0.01% interest at the time, but we're going to keep your money safe. And by the way, we're going to outsource that to the government as well, because they're going to give us insurance that if you come get your money and we don't have it, they're going to provide it for you. Now, Ron goes to the bank and says, I want to borrow 100 k and they go, okay, Ron, we don't really know you very well, but you seem to be really good at what you're doing and you have a high credit score and you seem very trustworthy and we like your business plan, so we'll lend you the $100,000 at 11% interest. Okay, they're paying me, we'll call it 1%, they get to keep 10%, plus they get to charge fees to actually go through the origination process and, and everything else. Okay, so the bank is taking that on. Now they're going to charge other fees to, to have an account and to move money around and ACH and wire and, and all these other things because they control the transfer of the money. Because once Ron's borrowing it, he has to have an account there, he has to use it for his banking and everything. So they are charging these fees, they're, they're keeping this interest. Now, again, this isn't bad because this provided the scale and it provided a way that we could outsource some of the trust and some of, and some of those workings and some of those functions to some other entity that, is, that, that has the backing of the, of the US government or the backing of whatever government it is and they're connected to other banks 
right? They have the, the pipes so that they can connect and move money. We've outsourced to that. And that's fine until they violate that trust, until, until they put in banking hours and say, you can't transfer money elsewhere in the world except Monday through Friday these hours. And you can't come into our branch except for these hours. And if you give Ron money or you send this person money, they won't see it for three days. Even though we know that it's all electronic and, and they can do it pretty much instantaneously. When they start violating that trust and violating uh, th those functions, then we say, all right, is there a better way? And Bitcoin showed us that there was a better way, except we had to add to just Bitcoin. It had to be more than that. And that is the essence of decentralized finance. We say, can we take this function and decentralize it? And by that, we mean, can we have other people connect and do this function? Can we have algorithms and code and other people with their computers connect and take on this function and take some of this out and disperse it to some of these people in the decentralized way? And it means I might get to keep more, Ron might get a lower interest rate, or he might get a higher interest rate, but he has more people to choose from. He can offer less collateral, whatever it might be. That is the essence of decentralized finance. It is how can... I keep my money safe and, and growing, and how can the people like Ron be able to borrow or be able to utilize money? And that's what decentralized finance is. So originally, of course, built on the Ethereum blockchain with ETH as its native token, but now there are other blockchains that utilize smart contracts, and smart contracts are just, they're just code. They're say if, yeah, essentially if then code. If, if my goods get to Ron based on some GPS locator or something, Ron's money will come to me and it will all be done electronically. That's a smart contract. So now we have this system where instead of Adam putting money in a bank and Ron borrowing, right now potentially Adam can put money into some sort of code, some sort of algorithm, and Ron can borrow from that. Right? Isn't, isn't this just acting like a bank? And they said, okay, we have to give Adam some incentive. What's the incentive for Adam to put his money in here? Of course, it's interest. And what's the incentive for Ron to come borrow? Well, of course, it's, you know, he, he's going to have to pay interest for this money, and he can offer up something as collateral, and that something can be, some, be something digital in, in this realm. So this bank function has been taken over by some sort of protocol or token or coin or smart contract or whatever it might be. And so I am providing liquidity. I'm providing to this particular pool of money. I'm a liquidity provider. This is the essence of decentralized finance. Now, this can be lending money. This can be investing. This can be some liquidity pool that says Ron just wants to put in one particular token, ETH, and he wants to take out DAI, which is a, a stable coin, one that's relatively pegged to the dollar, and he's going to have to pay some small fee to do that. Now he can do that at, you know, th there, there's banks that will exchange your currency, dollars for, for pesos or yen or, or whatever, and they charge some fee. So what the, these protocols, decentralized finance said is, look, we can pay, and instead of going to this centralized figure, this bank that's going to hold all these different currencies, why don't we have people like Adam and others put their money, their ETH, or their DAI into this pool, and when Ron wants to put one in, he can take the other one out. Why do we have to have a bank do that? We can do that ourselves. We have the code, and there's a small little fee. Well, why would Adam do that? Because he gets a percentage of the fee of every trade that Ron or anyone else comes in and makes. That's what decentralized finance is, is the fact that we can outsource so much of these relationships to code, a lot of the things that banks were doing or corporations were doing to facilitate the transfer of money and to grow wealth and to, and to put money to use in efficient ways is being outsourced now to code and a protocol because we can do it in a decentralized way, because we can do it in a way where those that want to contribute to the pools can get paid a fee because this algorithm is going to calculate it for them. This money can be held safe. Oh, and by the way, if I say, man, I don't know if this is so safe, this is still code, it could be hacked. Well, someone else came in and said, okay, let's take the insurance function that the government usually provides. Let's see if we can decentralize that. Well, other people provide money for the pool, right? Well, they provide liquidity to some insurance company, some insurance contract that says, if this gets hacked, we're gonna pay Adam. Yeah, we've done that. 
Okay, so we're taking all these functions of the financial system and saying, how can we take the inefficiencies that we see now, the things that the banks and, these other, and the insurance companies and everything else is responsible for that we're paying them for, how can we do that and distribute that risk among other people who are willing to put their money there for some sort of incentive? So it's a series of incentive mechanisms based on some sort of code and figuring out how, to, how money can be used more efficiently when we don't have to go through these centralized figures of banks and governments and insurance companies and other companies like that. How can my money get to Ron more efficiently because it doesn't have to make as many hops where everyone is, all these companies are taking a fee and they then have to go pay their people and, and, and stockholders and such. Again, not that banks are all that bad because they served a purpose for so long, but what we've seen is a lot of the purposes and a lot of the efficiencies that they tried to create are no longer efficient. And we can take all this out and we can go straight peer to peer from Adam and Ron through this protocol to where we don't even have to know each other. All we have to do is trust that this code is working. And even if the code ends up not working, someone else has said, we'll take care of that. And we'll get a bunch of people to put in money here and they, they will earn as long as this doesn't get hacked or cracked or broken or anything. They will continue to earn. This is usually the job of an insurance company. Well, where does an insurance company usually get money? It usually gets money from, from the, the insureds or, or they raise money in the public market or something. Well, this is saying, look, we'll go to the public. We'll just do it in a way where they just connect their wallet their technology, their software that holds their funds, they just connect it and say, look, I'm okay providing this because maybe I'll get 12%. Where else am I going to get 12% on my money? I can do that. And by the way, I can be anywhere in the world and contribute to that. That is the essence of decentralized finance. How are we going to create these incentive structures to take out the inefficiencies that are in the current financial system and distribute them to the people who are willing to provide their funds? Hopefully they do it safely and that's what we're working on now is how do we do this safely? How do we do this in, in an even more efficient way? But the fact that there's all this code, the fact that there are all these people all over the world building on this that's so much open source is what's making it move at breakneck speed and sometimes it moves a little too fast uh, and people get hurt and people get hacked and they lose money and we have to pull back a little bit and say what did we do wrong? But for the time being it's moving so fast because code is, is able to be developed and tested faster than systems that involve people and buildings and, and traditionally moving money. This is just moving electrons, it's moving digital dollars, it's moving digital funds back and forth. We can test it really quickly, that's why it's moving fast. So decentralized finance is just a series of, of incentive mechanisms and code used to facilitate the, the financial ecosystem of the world, used to get money from where it is now to where it can be more efficiently deployed, but in a way that keeps it relatively safe, in a way that gives incentives to everyone to move the money along in the process. So we hope that made sense for you. We hope you'll subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube, and, and we hope this made sense, go uh, check out our website. We have some courses available to help teach you about Bitcoin and crypto and DeFi and how to get involved. Uh, and, and we hope you'll follow us on Twitter at Interaxis8. We hope you enjoy this video. We hope you see, to see you more in the future.